We're going to go over what it means for a matrix to be diagonalizable. We'll also go over how to diagonalize a matrix and how we can show that a matrix isn't diagonalizable. There are chapters in the description so you can skip around the video as you please. Let's begin with the definition. We say that an n by n matrix A is diagonalizable if it is similar to a diagonal matrix. Link in the description to my video introducing similar matrices. But by definition, it just means this. A is diagonalizable if there exists an invertible matrix P so that P inverse AP is a diagonal matrix. The idea is that similar matrices have a whole lot in common. So if a matrix A is similar to a diagonal matrix D, then we can learn a lot about the matrix A by using the easier to work with diagonal matrix D. And so that's how diagonalizing a matrix could prove useful. Here is our key theorem concerning diagonalizability. If A is an n by n matrix, then A is diagonalizable if and only if A has n linearly independent eigenvectors. Often I leave proofs in separate videos for people who care about them, but we're going to do this proof right now because in the proof we'll go through the process that we actually use for diagonalizing a matrix. This is an if and only if theorem, so we'll have two directions to prove. Let's begin by assuming A is diagonalizable and we'll prove that it has n linearly independent eigenvectors. If A is diagonalizable, by definition, that means it's similar to some diagonal matrix. Hence, there exists some invertible matrix P, so that P inverse AP equals this diagonal matrix D. Multiplying both sides of this equation on the left by P, we get that AP equals PD. Now we're going to do some work with the left side and the right side of this equation, but first we need to introduce some notation. We're going to let P1 through Pn denote the column vectors of this diagonalizing matrix P. And we're going to let lambda1 through lambda n denote the diagonal entries of D. We know that the diagonal entries of a diagonal matrix are its eigenvalues, so these lambdas are the eigenvalues of D. And since A is similar to D, they also happen to be the eigenvalues of A. Now, on the left side, we have AP, which we can rewrite like this. This is the matrix P, just with its column vectors written individually. As we've previously discussed, matrix multiplication, we might say, distributes over the column vectors. So A times the matrix P is the same as the matrix consisting of P's column vectors, each multiplied by a. So A times P is the same as the matrix whose column vectors are the column vectors of P, but getting multiplied by A on the left. Now, on the right side of this equation, we have P times the diagonal matrix D. And in a previous video where we discussed diagonal matrices, we saw how multiplying by a diagonal matrix on the right has the effect of just multiplying the columns of the matrix on the left by the successive diagonal entries of the diagonal matrix. Hence, the result of this multiplication will be to hit the first column vector of P with the first diagonal entry of D, and then to hit the second column vector of P with the second diagonal entry of D, and so on. This is just how multiplying by a diagonal matrix on the right works. So PD, the right side of this equation, equals this. So we have that this on the left side equals this on the right side. These are two matrices that are equal and each with n column vectors. Hence, the corresponding column vectors must be equal. We then get these n equations. A times P1 equals lambda 1 P1, those first column vectors. A P2 equals lambda 2 P2, and so on. Then, by definition, we see from these n equations that P1 through Pn are eigenvectors of A, because P1 times A is a scalar multiple of P1. 
P2 times A is a scalar multiple of P2, and so on. So these column vectors that we took from our diagonalizing matrix P just so happen to be the eigenvectors of A. Furthermore, we know that P is invertible. That's because A was assumed to be diagonalizable, which means that it's similar to a diagonal matrix D, which means that there exists this invertible matrix P satisfying this equation. So P is invertible. And we've previously proven that that's equivalent to its columns, which are the n eigenvectors. The n eigenvectors are the columns of P. Since P is invertible, those columns are linearly independent. So those n columns, which are the n eigenvectors, are linearly independent. And so we've proven the first direction of the theorem. A being diagonalizable implies that it has n linearly independent eigenvectors. Now for the reverse direction, we'll assume that A has n linearly independent eigenvectors, and we must prove it's diagonalizable. This is going to follow mostly the same reasoning, but in reverse. So we're assuming A has n linearly independent eigenvectors. Let's call those P1 through Pn. And let's say they correspond to the eigenvalues lambda1 through lambda n. Then we'll construct the matrix P whose column vectors are those n eigenvectors. And we're going to let D be the diagonal matrix whose diagonal entries are those n eigenvalues of A. So in the previous direction, these things were part of the assumption, P and D. In this direction, we're constructing them in a way that we kind of know is going to work out. All right, so then we're going to have some very similar equations to what we just saw. A times P, well, we know that A just distributes over the column vectors, so A times P is equal to this. Each column is just one of the eigenvectors, P1 through Pn, but multiplied by the matrix A. But then in this case, we assumed that P1 through Pn are those n linearly independent eigenvectors of A. Hence, each column vector, AP1, AP2, and so on, is just a scalar multiple of that eigenvector. AP1 must be lambda1, P1 ap2 must be lambda2, p2, and so on. Again, this is because in this direction, p1 through pn are assumed to be eigenvectors. But then this matrix is just the column vectors of p, each hit by one of the eigenvalues. Those eigenvalues are precisely the diagonal entries of the matrix D, that diagonal matrix that we constructed. Hence, we see that this is the same as p times D on the right. Multiplying by a diagonal matrix on the right, again, has the effect of hitting the columns with those diagonal entries, which are the eigenvalues. Then we use the same equivalence as before between invertibility and linearly independent columns, except we're using it in the reverse direction. In this case, the eigenvectors, which we used as the columns of P, were assumed to be linearly independent. Since P has linearly independent columns, it must be an invertible matrix. Since P is invertible, we can take this equation, AP equals PD, and multiply both sides on the left by P inverse. So on the left side of the equation, we have P inverse AP, and on the right side of the equation, P inverse P cancels out and just leaves D. So we've shown that A is similar to a diagonal matrix. Hence, A is diagonalizable. So having n linearly independent eigenvectors implies that a matrix is diagonalizable. And in this direction of the proof, we see exactly how we can diagonalize a matrix. It comes down to constructing the matrix that consists of the n eigenvectors as its columns. Here's one more important theorem that gives us a quick way to potentially determine if a matrix is diagonalizable. If lambda 1 through lambda k are distinct eigenvalues of a matrix A, then the corresponding eigenvectors are necessarily linearly independent. So distinct eigenvalues have linearly independent eigenvectors. Hence, if a matrix has n distinct eigenvalues, it must have n linearly independent eigenvectors. And from our previous theorem, that would mean the matrix is diagonalizable. So this is an immediate consequence of this theorem and the one we just proved. An n by n matrix with n distinct eigenvalues is diagonalizable. 
And since we know that the eigenvalues of a diagonal matrix are its diagonal entries, if an n by n matrix has n distinct eigenvalues, then the diagonal matrix that it's similar to is just the matrix whose diagonal entries are the eigenvalues. That's a whole lot of words though, so let's try out an actual example. These are the steps to diagonalize an n by n matrix. First, we should determine if the matrix even is diagonalizable by checking if it has n linearly independent eigenvectors. Like we just saw, one way we may be able to do that is to check if the matrix has n distinct eigenvalues. If it does, then the matrix for sure is diagonalizable. Second, if we determine that the matrix actually is diagonalizable, then we can construct the matrix P whose n columns are the eigenvectors of our original matrix. The order in which we put the columns, hence the eigenvectors, is not important. Finally, once we have that matrix P, P inverse AP will be a diagonal matrix, with the n eigenvalues corresponding to successive columns of P as its diagonal entries. So this diagonal matrix, P inverse AP, the diagonal entries will each correspond to the successive eigenvectors that we used to build P. The eigenvalue corresponding to P2, for example, will be the second diagonal entry in that diagonal matrix. Let's use these steps to find a matrix P that diagonalizes this matrix A. We'll begin by finding the eigenvalues, which we can then use to find the corresponding eigenvectors. To find the eigenvalues, we must find the determinant of this matrix, lambda i minus a. That's done easily with a cofactor expansion along the third column. We end up getting this factored polynomial, lambda minus 5 times lambda plus 1 times lambda minus 3. The roots of this characteristic polynomial are the three eigenvalues. It's worth noting that we could stop at this point, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Because this is a 3x3 three three matrix, and we just found that it has three distinct eigenvalues, we know already that this matrix is diagonalizable, and once we diagonalize it, we also know exactly what it's going to look like. It's just going to be the diagonal matrix whose diagonal entries are those three distinct eigenvalues. So it would look like that, and we could just go from there. In general, though, if we actually want to find that matrix P that diagonalizes A, we're going to need to find the eigenvectors. On the other hand, it's also possible that we only find two distinct eigenvalues, in which case it's still possible that the matrix is diagonalizable, but we'd have to find how many eigenvectors are in the bases for the eigenspaces in order to be sure. So it's possible that we only found two distinct eigenvalues, one of the eigenspaces could have one vector, and the other eigenspace could have two basis vectors, and so we could still have three linearly independent eigenvectors, and so the matrix could still be diagonalizable, but those are just some of the steps that we would have to take more generally. In this particular case, as soon as we see three distinct eigenvalues, we know it's diagonalizable. For completeness, and of course because we were specifically asked to find that diagonalizing matrix P, we will actually find the eigenvectors in this problem. So here's a basis for the eigenspace corresponding to the eigenvalue 5, and then for the eigenvalue negative 1, we get this basis. And then for the eigenvalue positive 3, we get this basis. In each case, we just plug the corresponding eigenvalue into this matrix and then find a basis for its null space. That's a basis for the eigenspace of the original matrix. I'm not going to go over these in detail. It's just Gauss-Jordan elimination and then finding a basis vector. There are links in the description to my videos on eigenvalues and eigenvectors if you need a more thorough recap of this. But once we get these three eigenvectors, we can use them in whatever order we please to construct our diagonalizing matrix P. So here's our matrix P. Its first column is the basis vector for the eigenspace corresponding to the eigenvalue 5. Its second column is the basis vector for the eigenspace corresponding to negative 1, and so on. 
Now to actually use this matrix to diagonalize A, we also need to find P inverse. So we're gonna have to invert this matrix. Let's quickly do that. We can find the inverse of the matrix by augmenting P with the identity, and then just perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on this augmented matrix. Once we get the identity on the left side, what's on the right is P inverse. So P inverse is equal to that matrix on the right. And now that we have P and P inverse, we can diagonalize A, and we already know from our earlier discussion what that's gonna look like. It's just gonna be a diagonal matrix with those eigenvalues on its entries. And here's what that looks like. P inverse AP, the diagonal matrix that A is similar to, is P inverse times A times P. P inverse times A gets us this matrix. That still needs to get multiplied by P, and you can verify that we arrive at this as our final product. That's the diagonal matrix D, whose diagonal entries are the eigenvalues of A. A is similar to this diagonal matrix. Many properties of A we may be interested in, such as its eigenvalues, its nullity, its rank, could all be determined from this similar diagonal matrix. We'll also see in the next video how we can calculate powers of A using this diagonalized form. Here's another example of what it would look like if we were showing that a matrix was not diagonalizable. So this matrix is not diagonalizable. At a glance, we can see that it has only two eigenvalues, three and two, those are the diagonal entries. Because this is a triangular matrix, those diagonal entries we know are the eigenvalues. Now, just because it doesn't have three distinct eigenvalues doesn't mean that it doesn't have three linearly independent eigenvectors, but we do have to do the work of finding bases for the eigenspaces to check. As it turns out, the eigenspace corresponding to three only has a single basis vector, so that eigenspace has dimension one. Similarly, the eigenspace corresponding to the other eigenvalue also has dimension one, just a single basis vector. So this matrix A has only two linearly independent eigenvectors. And as we know from the theorem we proved earlier, that means that it cannot be diagonalizable. A is a three by three matrix, but it doesn't have three linearly independent eigenvectors. It only has two of them. So it's not diagonalizable. It's also worth mentioning that if we just wanted to check if A is diagonalizable and we weren't interested in actually constructing the matrix P, then we could do this a little more quickly because we don't need to find these basis vectors for the eigenspaces. The dimension of the eigenspace corresponding to this eigenvalue is just the nullity of this matrix. But I know what the nullity of this matrix is pretty much at a glance because it's a three by three matrix and I can tell that its rank is two. So its nullity is just one. That's the dimension of its null space, which is also the dimension of the eigenspace of A corresponding to this eigenvalue. Similarly, since the rank of this matrix is two, its nullity must be one as well by the dimension theorem for matrices. So just from that, I know that the dimension of the eigenspace corresponding to three is one, and the dimension of the eigenspace corresponding to two is one as well. So there are only two linearly independent eigenvectors. With this approach, I don't even need to figure out what they are. I already know that A isn't diagonalizable. And I made this point earlier, but I just wanna drive it home once more. We know that an N by N matrix with N distinct eigenvalues use is diagonalizable. So at a glance, I could look at this matrix, which is upper triangular, and immediately know it's diagonalizable. Since it's upper triangular, its eigenvalues are its diagonal entries, and its diagonal entries here are distinct. Hence, it has three distinct eigenvalues, so it's diagonalizable, and I know what diagonal matrix it's similar to. It must be similar to this diagonal matrix, whose diagonal entries are the eigenvalues. And of course, this also lets me assume that there is an invertible matrix P, so that P inverse AP is actually 
equal to that diagonal matrix. So that's what diagonalizing a matrix is. That's how to do it. That's how to check diagonalizability. And I hope this was helpful. Please let me know in the comments if you have any questions and be sure to check out my linear algebra course and linear algebra exercises playlists in the description for more. If you find my linear algebra videos helpful, please consider supporting what I do by joining Wrath of Math as a channel member. You can get early and exclusive access to select videos as well as access to these lecture notes if you join at the premium tier or above. Thanks for watching. Stressed out, sweetie, I'm stressed out. Sounds like you've been stressed out. Tell me what you're stressed about. Stressed out, honey, I've been stressed out lately. Don't know what's what, don't know what I'm stressed about. Stressed out, sweetie, I'm stressed out. Sounds like you've been stressed out. Tell me what you're stressed about.